Step one is to familiarize yourself with the equipment you're analyzing. We can't overemphasize the importance of this step. If you don't know what's inside a gearbox, for example, you can't reasonably analyze it. You have to know the number of gears in the box and the number of teeth on each of them. You'll need access to drawings and manufacturer's literature. If you can picture the equipment, you're much more likely to be able to interpret the vibration spectrum. Step 2 is to calculate important speeds and frequencies. This is another important step because these numbers will serve as the basis for later analysis. You'll learn what the important speeds and frequencies are for different types of equipment, but here's the gist of it. We'll start with the one times or rotating speed of the shaft. Then if we're looking at a fan we'll want to know the number of blades so we can calculate the blade path frequency. If you're looking at a gear we'll want to know the number of teeth so we can calculate the gear mesh frequency and so on. We'll identify the important speeds and frequencies for each type of equipment as we proceed. For training purposes, we will manually calculate the important speeds and frequencies, and we will do so before we even look at the vibration spectrum. This way you'll know the vibration spectrum, or, and the spectrum may seem a little less complicated. In actual practice, the calculations can be performed using the analysis software. As you become more comfortable using the computer, you will probably rely more and more on its automatic processing features, but it's important to start with a clear understanding of what the numbers mean. Step 3 is to find the one times in the spectral data. With this step, you're past the preliminaries. You're relating peaks in the spectrum to events taking place in the equipment. That's what it means to analyze vibration. There are a couple of software tools that will prove handy. The first is the cursor. It usually appears as a small box of some sort, and it may have crosshairs like a sighting device. You can position the cursor using either the mouse or the left and right arrows on the keyboard. Placing the cursor on a peak, in essence, calls the peak to the attention of the computer. The analysis software will then provide information such as the amplitude of the peak and its frequency. In step 2, we calculated important speeds and frequencies, and we always started with the one times. You'll know you've located the one times in the spectral data when you place the cursor on a peak with a frequency matching or very nearly matching the calculated one times value. In addition to the cursor, you'll have a vertical line or a marker, which you can place on a second peak. The analysis software will automatically measure the distance between the cursor and the marker. In the frequency domain, the distance between the peaks is known as the delta frequency, or frequency change from one peak to the next. In the time domain, we would be measuring delta time, which is the amount of time which elapsed from one peak to the next. Another software tool you should know about is the zoom. It allows you to change the scale of the spectrum for a wide view or a close-up. When you first look at a spectrum, be sure to check both the amplitude scale and the frequency scale so that the zoom control can't confuse you. Step 4 is to identify signature vibration patterns. In this step, we'll again use the cursor to locate peaks we calculated in Step 2. As we said before, if we're analyzing a fan, we'll try to locate the blade pass frequency. If we're analyzing a gear set, we'll try to locate the gear mesh frequency. Each type of equipment will have a characteristic vibration pattern you would expect to find. In this example, it's act to find and a blade pass frequency. In this one, it's a one times and a gear mesh. Step 5 is to identify other vibrations present, and we'll give you some examples. First of all, let's say you mark a peak with the cursor and a string of additional cursors appears, each marking another peak. These peaks are known as harmonics. They are whole number multiples of the peak you selected. Let's say you placed the cursor on a peak at 100 Hz. 
You might see harmonics at 200 Hz, 300 Hz, and so on. The peak you originally marked with the cursor is known as the fundamental frequency. The harmonics are multiples of the fundamental frequency, such as two times, three times, and on down the line. You may even find subharmonics at one half or one fourth turning speed, for example. Harmonics and subharmonics are the sign of a problem. The more of them you find and the greater their amplitude, the worse the problem probably is. But the problem stems from the fundamental frequency. If you can find what's causing the fundamental frequency, you've found the source of the harmonics. You may also find vibration families. This is a general term used to describe groups of closely packed peaks, especially those of low to moderate amplitude that appear as a mound above the frequency scale. They too are indicative of a problem and should draw your attention. When a vibration family is found around the base of a prominent peak, the term sidebands is often used. We will discuss sidebands briefly when we get to bearings and more fully when we get to gearboxes. Traveling frequencies will show up in your data as well. You won't see them every day, but you'll see them. These are frequencies traveling from nearby equipment through structural steel, walls, or floors. Nearby, however, is a relative term. Powerful, heavy-duty equipment can produce vibrations that travel considerable distances. A vibration in a basement might be detected on the third floor. Traveling frequencies can be difficult to identify with confidence. Typically, you find a vibration peak, which you simply cannot explain. It's not a harmonic of any frequency you can identify, and nothing in the equipment you're analyzing would generate the peak. When you exhaust all possible explanations, you can only hope the peak is coming from outside the equipment. Proving it may be difficult. You can start by looking for nearby equipment which operates at the approximate speed of the frequency you can't explain. You might also want to take some readings to see if the vibration shows up in structural steel, and you might want to bump test the equipment you're monitoring to see if it has a natural frequency at or near the mystery frequency. The last vibration we will discuss is noise floor, which consists of, more or less, random, low-level vibrations occurring throughout the spectrum. An exaggerated noise floor often suggests that the equipment is in generally rough condition. Step 6 and make a recommendation. You'll often hear vibration analysis referred to as predicted maintenance, and unfortunately that term has confused a good many people. Vibration analysis will not enable you to predict the future. It may help you identify a developing problem, and it may tell you something about the severity of the problem, but it won't tell you how fast the problem will worsen. Even if you have considerable experience with a piece of equipment, what has happened in the past won't always be a good indicator of what will happen in the future. Condition monitoring or condition-based maintenance may be better terms. Try to accurately assess equipment condition, include known facts and potential problems, then formulate a recommendation for corrective action. Your recommendation should include one of three basic strategies. Repair now, which means shutting equipment down almost immediately before catastrophic failure occurs. Repair soon, which will require scheduling a shutdown. Repair later, during the next regularly scheduled shutdown. If you're not sure whether a problem requires immediate attention, it may be possible to order a check or short shutdown for visual inspection. You'll begin to appreciate the distinction between recommending a corrective action and making a prediction after you've seen a few examples.